Hello and welcome. My name is Roni Firon and this is The Bigger Picture. I'm a psychology grad student researching personality and one of the things that I'm fascinated by is the psychological makeup of entrepreneurs. So today we have with us Yuval Tal, the founder of Payoneer and partner at Teammate. Welcome Yuval and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So to begin, can you give the audience a bit of a background about yourself? Yeah, so I'll tell a little bit about it because I think it's relevant for this discussion, the, the journey and the, uh, I've done most of the position within startups. So I, I was in R&D, in research and development, then product, then marketing, then sales, then business development. And then I ran a company, a startup company. Only later I started the first company. Uh, so by then I knew pretty much how to manage the position that I was uh, hiring. Uh, that company called Border Free and we took it public a few years later. Uh, at some point in the journey of Border Free, I started Pioneer, and also Pioneer went all the way to be public, and you know, it's traded in NASDAQ. Um, so in this journey, I've managed and, and went into so many, like thousands of situations that are relevant for the discussion of the soft side of entrepreneurship. And I think the psychological part of it is probably the underestimated and undervalued part of entrepreneurship. So I'm excited about this. Amazing, amazing. So today we're going to talk all about the good, the bad, and the ugly of entrepreneurship. And there's a bigger idea behind everything that we're, we'll be talking about, which is, do you have what it takes, right? Everybody wants to know. We hear a lot about the fairy tale success stories, but we don't really get to see what's happening backstage. And we don't hear too much about the pain that's associated with the entrepreneurial journey. So I want to take the chance today to talk about the psychological component of being an entrepreneur. What does it take emotionally and mentally to succeed in this field? Uh, and to talk about how to manage the ups and the downs of the entrepreneurial life. So before we get into all of that, let's start by defining our terms. How do you define entrepreneurship? So I would start with saying, I understand that entrepreneurship is not for everybody. I just don't understand why. <laughs> I think that, so I, I maybe we'll divide it to solo entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, people who are basically want to control their own life and want to start their career and, and manage their, their um, life with their skills. And probably anyone in this set who are helping us to make this video uh, are entrepreneurs, right? So there's a producer and there's Photographers, they are entrepreneurs. Right, and I self starting. Think, absolutely. And what COVID and internet in the last few years brought is amazing opportunity for many people to flourish and, uh, and, and, and express themselves and, and really do an amazing things with companies like Fiverr and Amazon and uh, just in programmers and just so many opportunities of people to have their own business and they can grow to a few people and it's just amazing. So I think solo entrepreneurs, it's like a whole new thing of itself and we should probably cover it later on. It's an amazing paradigm shift that happens. Uh, but I think today we can focus on, I guess, more of a, a classic entrepreneurship when we talk about institution money, where you go to okay. VC and you grow and you have a company and maybe one day it's going to be bought or go public. And I think in that case, there's much more insecurity of the question, do I have it? Like, do I have the material? Do I have the, the passion? Can I take the commitment? Can I take the risk? And those are genuine questions. This is not just a psycho mumbo. This is serious stuff because the commitment is serious. Um, and and then that's the kind of, that's the context of today. I would talk about the journey of finding a niche, finding an idea, finding a team, finding financing, going to this angel VC process and, and commitment of, of, of building a company. Okay. So in general, entrepreneurship is when you make your own path, right? When you... I, I would say I think you make your own path, but I think people are much more entrepreneur than they think, right? So if you organize a party, mm -hmm. what is it called, right? If you make your own clip on TikTok, that's a pretty much, like, that's a, it's an initiative. You, you may get views or likes, not necessarily money, but I think entrepreneurship is much broader than that. And yes, I think people that initiate things and make things happen, that's entrepreneurship. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. So now, now that we understand what entrepreneurship is, how, how do you know if entrepreneurship is right for you? How do you know if you have what it takes and if you have the right qualities? What do you think people should kind of be aware of that is really necessary for this field? 
you need to be a white male and you're okay. okay. <laughs> so um, so th the, the good thing about right to entrepreneurship, it's probably the most democratic, fair, equal uh, opportunity ever exist in, in mankind, really. Right, because if you want to sell something on Amazon and you go and you find something in China uh, to make and then you ship it and you sell it and you market it, nobody cares who you are, right? So it's like it's good for any person anywhere. So it's very, very equal opportunity. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's the kind of the first thing I would say. The second thing is there is no one makeup of a person. So there's many, many type of people who succeed. And Different most, flavors of entrepreneurs. Right, um, flavors and uh, there's many personality traits, there's many, many uh, ways and there's nothing that you can say you need to be a certain type. However, there are, th there are certain things, especially when on a kind of more committed type of entrepreneurship, like we spoke uh, with the VC and taking money, other people's money to, ma to make successful, successful um, it's not easy. That's okay, it's not like, yeah, you know, let me try it. Um, I would say maybe we could use it uh, piano as an analogy. Like if you, sell, okay. if you if if you ask someone if he knows how to play the piano, the answer cannot be, "I'll try." Maybe I know it. It's like yeah. there's a you either know yeah, or you there, don't. Yeah. So the commitment is total, and to be to be able to succeed, you need to be really, really, really committed. Um, that's kind of I guess universal. I think there's also there's no you can't do it part time. You can't do it and, and three, just drop the pen and go and, and, and be with your kids. That doesn't work. Um, you sleep with it, you eat with it, you, 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 you are, even if you're with other people, you're present, but you're absent. So it's very, very total. And for many reasons, but one of them, and I'll just name few, you take other people and you link their destiny with you to build a company. Uh, you're spending a good few years, typically, to try to have a collective group that create value. You take money from people who don't want to lose it. They expect you to give them very high return. Uh, there's a board that you need to report to. There are customers that you need to report to. Uh, there are customers who took a lot of personal risk to use your product and not someone else's because they trusted you. All of this with the fear of failure puts you in a pretty, pretty tight spot. It's not cute. <laughs> uh, and I think that uh, and that's universal, and you need, to, you need to know that that's what's going to happen when you go walk in. So if the motivation is, I think it's cool, it's going to help you on Tinder, that doesn't, not going to work out. Uh, you need to really understand what he's getting into. And I think it's, it's, it's important to talk to other founder entrepreneurs, to other CEOs, not to lawyers, not to uh, accountants. Speak to the people who went through this journey before you start to understand what you're getting into. Absolutely. No, so First of all, the commitment that you mentioned, being 100% committed to the goal, to the mission, and that perseverance, that dedication, that conscientiousness, right? And ability to stick the path. And also, from everything that you've been talking about, this high stress position, it sounds like to me, requires someone who can handle stress pretty well. Yeah, so we could talk about, I guess, Things that can help you, you don't need to have all of them, but I think the things that help, right? So the one thing you're going to have is years of uncertainty. Like, you're probably going to have a near-death experience every week or month, and you need to somehow go through it. Um, you may have money to pay salaries, or you may not, and you're going to have to go through this. And that uncertainty can drive people crazy. So you need to be able to withstand that uncertainty. Uh, comfortable, comfortable with the unknown, comfortable with uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, you need to be able to sell, whether you to sell to employees that you want them to work for you or with you, uh, to sell to investors, to sell to customers. Like you need to be able to handle the situation where you walk into a room and you walk away with a contract. Uh, not with thoughts, not with uh, like a uh, good meeting. You need to be able to go with, with achievement. So that's kind of, it's there. Focus helps a lot. Uh, tenacity helps a lot. Ability to go into conflict, right? So you cannot be, if you're a pleaser, it's going to be, you're going to have a hard time, right? Because right. you cannot please all, all the people all the time. Yeah, if you're overly agreeable and you're a people pleaser and you don't like to say no, then this you, might not be for you. You're going to be miserable. But 
even when you go into conflicts, you need to be able to go to a conflict and be able to go through the other side of the conflict while continuing to work with the person. You cannot burn bridges, right? Right, you don't want to break the other person on the other side. You cannot, right. Uh, and that's art, right? Because sometimes you go into like a very passionate conflict and it's tough. Right, so dance to, uh, to uh, reach that win-win. Yes, and sometimes you need to stomach what you think or know it's a complete mistake and be able to see it fails and not be able to do anything about it and just go with it. We can go with it. There is a, a little bit of, uh, sometimes success is, uh, is insane. So you need to be a little bit insane to be able that you can make it. A friend told me once that the difference between madness and genius is success. Yeah, okay, so. A few more things that are, I think are, that can help a lot is, I mean, courage helps a lot because you're gonna need it. Um, there is also, and I would maybe use some little bit of a provocation, right? So there's always the question why there's, why there's more men entrepreneurs than women entrepreneurs. And one of the theories that I think is relevant is that in order to be a good entrepreneur, you need to deal with a lot of rejections and slaps and shutting doors and a lot of things that uh, trigger your insecurity. And maybe historically men are much more uh, practiced in rejection. <laughs> Much more comfortable with rejection. Right. So Familiar maybe, with yeah. it. <laughs> so maybe women entrepreneurs who want to be entrepreneurship go practice rejection and then uh, and start your company. Ready for yeah, it. yeah. So, <laughs> um, uh, focus is really important. Uh, being able to uh, be decisive, make decisions. Um, making decision is is critical. Uh, in most companies, there is one CEO, one founder CEO that uh, they need to make the decisions. Uh, the speed of making the decision is probably critical. Uh, it doesn't need to be capricious, random decision. It needs to be informative, deep thoughts, well-established, well-logical decisions, but you need to make a decision. Sometimes I would say that even the decision is not optimal. It's much better to make a decision than to procrastinate too right. long. Not making um, a decision is a decision in itself. Exactly, exactly. Right, and I think that point about focus is also important just to you know, tune into that because it's being able to stay the course, to be focused on the big mission and not to be you know, distracted by different opportunities and to remember you know, what you're moving forward to. So that focus, um, it's, it's, it's important for, for many different things here. I agree. How much of a role do you think IQ plays? Does an entrepreneur necessarily have to be the smartest guy in the room to succeed? So you cannot be stupid, that doesn't help. But I, I would say and maybe kind of address the issues of most people insecurity about I'm not very good at this, I'm not very good at this, I'm not very good with math. So luckily, and, and I've seen many, many successful entrepreneurs which have different type of intelligence and different things. So I would say, yes, it's important, but not necessarily book smart, not necessarily mathematics smart. Uh, I've seen amazing success, successes where the entrepreneur was, had the magical ability to make people work together well. He could address conflict. He created an environment that was flourishing. That's genius, and it has nothing to do with algorithms or, or uh, differential equations. Um, you see a lot of so the intelligence of, of of storytelling becomes such a critical element of being able to raise money, in and it's not technical. It's really intelligence. I think Obama was an amazing speaker. I don't know if he's good at math, but he was amazing, right? Right, uh, so but he was dripping charisma. Exactly. So, uh, and that's intelligence, right? So, I think that uh, it's important, but it doesn't. It's not one type of intelligence is relevant. I think that by itself widened the circle of people who can be entrepreneurs. Right. Right. Everyone has their strengths. So, as we said today, entrepreneurship has become quite romanticized because people really only hear about the Cinderella stories and about the glamour of success. But there's a lot more to it, obviously. So what kind of myths would you like to dispel today? Um, and what do you wish most people would understand about what it really takes to be an entrepreneur? Yes, I think we spoke a little bit about uncertainty, and I think the word romanticize is actually quite important, right? Because you only hear on the extreme, the successes, and suddenly it's like it's reachable. And the uh, tragedies. And, yeah, or the extreme other side, yeah. the Terranos, whatever. So um, the statistics, the statistics is not at your favor. Uh, it's one to 10, one to 20. I think it's better, much better than it used to be. But the statistics is not 
fair. Right. Like the it's odds are against you. Odds are against you. So what's really important is to have an unfair advantage. An unfair advantage, unfair advantage, for example, would be like a killer team or an investor who says, if whatever you do, I'm going to support you so you, have, you know you're going to be able to get to round A. Or a customer who says, listen, if you bring me this product, I'm buying. You, need, you want to have, I call it like the probability of success, but you want to work and make sure that you have an unfair higher probability of success than other, one, than, other, than other groups. Otherwise, it's a really, really tricky, dangerous journey. You can spend years and eventually it's going to be nothing. It's more, most companies will end up in nothing. So that's kind of, um, uh, the, I guess, the sad side of entrepreneurship. It, it, even there's also, if you look at the saddest side, if you start a company and it fails miserably immediately, then you got lucky. It's the... Slow living deaths. dead yeah. yes, of a company for years that you manage to get a little bit of more money, a little bit more money, and you survive, and then four or five years later, you basically, okay, it's enough already. Uh, and people do it for five years or ten years, and then it's dead, and it's just, you don't have too many bullets. You, there's no, there's no many t chances you can do it. So it's almost like, um, yeah, you, you want to be honest with, with the odds, you want to be honest, even when you, after you start a company, you want to have uh, honest all the time if this is picking up or not. So there's a lot of talk today about how failures are good for us and how we should embrace failures and learn from them. And there's obviously a lot of truth to that, but it's so much easier said than done. And when you're dead in the middle of that failure, it's very counterintuitive at that moment to embrace it and learn from it. So I think you know, entrepreneurship requires a healthy relationship with failure because as you said, the probability of success is very low. So how do you think we should look at failure and what kind of relationship should we have with it? So first of all, I hate failure. <laughs> okay. It's like, okay. And it's, I think failure for the company is not an option. You can have hiccups. You can lose a customer, you can lose a person that uh, you don't want to lose. But it, you, start, you start a company with the, with the intention to succeed and with the tenacity to succeed. I wouldn't underestimate the importance of luck in success. Mm -hmm. However, I think it is true that the harder you work as a team, the luckier you get. The luckier you get. And I, I don't know that uh, failure is a, is a real, uh, and there's nothing to embrace. It's just... Right. Uh, so you don't subscribe to this I new don't. age idea uh, yeah, of like, you know, embracing yeah. our failures and our mistakes. And, and I don't think that them. you have too many, op too many chances. I don't think that if you fail once or twice, on a third time you're going to get as much as support as you have if you succeeded. I think that there is, again, this is success or failure for the company. Yeah? When you start a company, you take people's destiny in years of life, in weekends without the kid, in trips abroad, and you take investor money and you put it into creating value. And it's supposed to work. And you're supposed to know what you're doing and you're supposed to navigate the, the ship into a safe haven. It's not, it's not fun to fail on the company level. You need to withstand a lot of uh, problems on the way. But now, if you start a company, make sure that you have what it takes and you know what you're doing and you have a business plan and you have a model and you know how you're going to do the steps and take the homework and spend another month researching competition. But once you start, you better succeed. Right. So not to sugarcoat this idea of failure as no, being yes. something to... Yeah. I, always, to yeah, I always wonder who wrote it. Like. <laughs> like, okay, how many failures he had that he wrote? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, they had to kind of For rationalize that. I don't think it was Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. So, yeah. Probably not. But as you're saying, the relationship to failure should be fear of failure and having that. I think it's a great way to, preserve, put, to put it, yes. Right. And yes, once you start, yes. And that's the fire you underneath have no, yeah, and and, uh, that keeps you going. I think, you know, in military, in military uh, uh, history, uh, on critical battles, they put the soldier without any way to go back, right? So you look at D-Day, right? So there's a sea behind them. You go on a beach, this is it. Yeah. And they put the, the full soldier in a position where there's just, this is it, you have to win. Uh, the Russian used to shoot anyone who would f fly back. So I think it's some, something about entrepreneurship is once you start, this is it. Like, right, if, right. You tr if you try to run, there's no way back. There's, <laughs> there's, there's no way ocean out. behind you, you cannot go back, yeah. Right, but I think those high stakes also 
you know, they, they keep you motivated. They keep yes, you absolutely. keep you dedicated absolutely. to the mission. Absolutely. So on the flip side, we have success and strange things can happen when you reach your goals for the company. And when you're working so single mindedly on one mission and then you accomplish the mission, a lot of people find themselves in that position getting quite depressed, which usually comes as a huge surprise because you got everything you wanted, right? So you should be happy, right? So what do you think the biggest challenges are that come with success? And what do you think people should be aware of going into this kind of endeavor about what happens when you reach the finish line? I think it's okay to call it emptiness, not depression. Okay. Right, because it's like you work for a goal and suddenly there's like someone bought <laughs> you and like, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I think that there's a, there's a challenge to find new meaning. Uh, and I think that's, I guess, part of most people who are well off, the meaning, like how do you find meaning and how do you find, how do you define responsibility again and how do you get to the point where people need you, et cetera. Those are really psychological and probably my best advice is for people to go to therapy. So there's, I guess, maybe success uh, therapy, how to redefine your goals in life and your responsibilities and meaning, et cetera. Right, uh, if your goal was, um, you know, achieving financial stability, for your family and you reach that goal, then what else gives you meaning after that? Right, so in other words, your career is over because your career is not no longer meaningful for paying the mortgage. Now what? And that's a, that's a definition. I think people need to find their own way. But at this point, my best advice is to find therapy, to find- Find a good therapist. Find, exactly, <laughs> to go to someone who understand, yeah. Uh, and to find a therapist who can actually understand and go into the mindset of someone who is now well off. So that's, uh, it's accomplished and well off. It's not just the money. It's the money, but also the way the money was made and the recognition and the, the status and, of and it. status and the, and the respect you get from, from society and everything. It's, it's, a, it's a mix that you need to deal with. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a good problem to have. Though. So now we've spoken about whether or not you have what it takes, but how do you know if your idea is good enough, right? How do you know you're betting on a winning horse? I think, and I'll take it for the wider perspective, which is not only this, but how do you go even further with getting advice? And I think really, really important uh, uh, advice is to learn how to get advice. Okay. Uh, and there's, there's methodology to it, right? Um, so the first thing is, is, is choosing the right people to get the advice from. And I would divide it. So, for example, your friends can really be influential and important to tell you that you have it to be an entrepreneur, but they're irrelevant for the idea. Okay. There are people who know whether this idea or not is relevant and they see how the market goes and they have seen other companies and you need to find them. And this is not just anyone, they're not VC, they're not lawyers, they're not other entrepreneurs. There are specific industry experts who can see the vision and where the market trends and what's going on in the whole technology spectrum and find them. LinkedIn, Facebook, find them try to get their attention. Once you do, and it doesn't matter, and people like to help, make sure that you actually go and have the inter interaction with them in such a way that you can get the feedback. Don't try to convince them that what you have is a good idea. Try to poke and listen, poke and listen. Try to run with them, try to get their engagement and, and genuine feedback by them going into your shoes and trying to understand what is it that they agree with you have a potential to kind of crack into the industry. And I would say that art of receiving advice is probably the most important and critical thing of identifying and validating the idea. Really, really important. I think there's so much in that because on the one hand, it's being open to advice. And that's the um, you know, first thing that you need is to be open to getting input from others and not to have, you know, this kind of narrow view and not listening to anyone. So that's first of all. But on the other hand, as you said, you don't want to take advice from everyone. And we're bombarded with information and you know everyone's giving us feedback. And it's a really important question. How do you filter out the noise? And how do you filter out people who are a little, a little less relevant to that field, right? And going and seeking the industry experts, as you said. Exactly, and I would be laser focused, laser focused. I mean, TikTok is not a good source of, uh, of uh, advice, even though there's plenty of it there. It's a laser focus. Find at least two, three, four people 
if someone is basically trashing your idea, it doesn't mean that it's over. You need to be able to extend it and stomach it, okay? If, if three of them tell you, listen, something is weird, you may want to rethink it. Uh, but make sure that you have at least three or four or five people in the industry say, look, looking from all angles of it, and they are really, really people that you chose. It's almost like, I would say, the challenge is not, it's like almost like most of us are open and people have opinions, and especially in Israel, people are pushing their opinions even if they don't, <laughs> you didn't ask them for it. Um, and you want to make sure that you get the input from people who have the authority and the license, if you like, to speak about the idea itself. Right, and to be careful of our own confirmation bias because it's really easy to seek yes. out information that's going to confirm yes. what we think. So if they tell you it's a good idea, you have to count the seconds before they tell you. If they tell you right away, that's a good sign. If they, uh, well, I guess, then it's not a no, it's a no. So yes, there are also, other than the idea itself, uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of business model. And you can have a wonderful product with a wonderful audience, if, but there's no the business model. You can end up losing a lot of money. And nowadays where there's so much more money than startups, uh, you can fall into that trap and then once the market shakes, then you're done. So business model is, is, is really, really, really important. Right, so the vision is so important, but having that business model is the foundation, right? That will keep you going and will make sure that the company is actually profitable. It has, it's a business model. You can stay unprofitable, like I think Amazon was unprofitable for a long, long, long time. Okay. But it was clear they have a business model and they focused meticulously on experience. So yeah, I think it's the business model itself. You can show that unit economics works. Yeah. Okay, so you have the okay from the industry experts and you have your business model and everything is set to go. But as you move forward, how do you update the product um, based on the feedback you're getting from the market, right? And what I mean here is you might have a vision for how the product should look and what you're trying to sell people, but they're going to be telling you what kind of product they want to buy. So how do you integrate that information to update where the company is going? Yeah, so I think you know, we're covering the soft side of things, so I would cover the soft side of things, not to so much the mechanics. And uh, in this case, I would say most companies end up with different products and product evolve over time. So the feedback and the ongoing feedback is really critical. So I would divert to what we spoke about on the art of getting and receiving advice and the ability to be open and creative in turning your customers into partners and have enough engagement and open discussion with the customers to think with them. It's not just, you know, service them. It's just be able to uh, find few of the customers that are critically involved in you. Sometimes I would even give them option just to be able to think and be on my side and not just do us a favor. So I think that's really, it's critical. And it's also the company culture, like how much do you listen to the customers, how much the customers always wrong. I'll give an example, right? So at Pioneer, we had customers that, we, and we do the payments for them, but sometimes you can identify that they have a problem. Like let's say they, they do payment through you and you think there's something wrong with the payment or something wrong with the customer and you call them up and say, listen, we can do the transaction, but we encourage you to take a second look because something is weird. And if you can save the money, it doesn't matter if it's just a small amount of money. And even if it's Amazon who doesn't care about, uh, they are so thankful and you turn this into a relationship and then you get feedback and then you adjustments and then you add features. So I think that the, um, the, the art of giving and receiving advice, the communication, the ability to be open not to, is really critical here. It's a mutual relationship. It's a mutual relationship. Right? It go, goes back and forth. If you manage to do it, this is relationships. So we spoke about intelligence. Mm -hmm. So intelligence of being able to be attentive and building and in, in, in in, in maintaining relationship with customers, that's a very specific inter intelligence. It's like almost relationship intelligence, right? And you don't need to be a mathematician to do it, on the contrary almost, right? So um, if, if you have that, you have a lot. Right, having the sense for how to, how to interact with people and how to bring out the best in them. Create trust, create confidence, to create um, uh, rapport, to create friendship, to create uh, almost a sense of, of, of doing something together, even though it's a customer. Relation, yeah. Right. So now that we've been talking about, you know, the interpersonal element, let's talk about partners. And how do you know if you're picking the right partners? And what kind of qualities do you look for when entering a partnership? So uh, let's divide it to a few things. So if you're an entrepreneur, the biggest issue you're going to have 
is do I have a co-founder uh, at one point? And I think this is really tricky psychologically wise, right? Because most people are insecure and they think, okay, I'm good at relationship, but I'm not very good at, at R&D. So I'll go and find some who, someone who study engineering or programming and he will be my uh, co-wing and we can go and raise money because then the story is more complete. However, that may be the kiss of death for the company, right? Because equal partnerships don't work, not in marriage, no, no anywhere else, right? This is, it's unstable. So there's something about tyrannical management that is probably more likely to succeed. Right. And a friend once called it benevolent dictatorship. I like yes, that. So yes, right? <laughs> so when a dictator is a good person, it's probably better than democracy, especially in startup. I would say that number one reason for company fail, more than any other reason combined, is where founders don't get along. And it's not binary, it's kind of a exponential. The better you get along, the more you can achieve, the more you can get things done. So one of the ways to do it is you start alone and you build a company and you take your own money, you take your own risk and you spend three, four or five months of basically wilderness and kind of, um, kind of zombiness and try to figure this out how you put it together, but then you have something. And then you have maybe like a little bit of money from family and friends, and then you hire your co-founder. But then you already have the, the structure where you can make decision. It's right. not, you don't need to vote for everything like a kibbutz. You can actually make decision work. And then you have much higher probability of making decision. So the first thing is to try, it's before you even choose the person, is to choose the structure that allows you to, to run forward fast. And then on partners, I would say it's super critical, right? So the, the first initial, the initial team, super critical, super critical. Um, there's no substitute to spend time with them to really find the story about them. So they had a roommate 20 years ago, find the roommate. Okay, <laughs> they've been in the army, they've been to this. Find them, find out. Background check. Yes, there are people that people will say, whoa, if he's working with you, I'm joining also. And there's people who would say, yeah, he's a good guy. And you want to find those incredible, incredible partners that will bring with them people that would say, I'm, I'm going to work any, any, any company this person worked for, I'm going to work for him. You want to find them, it's critical. And sometimes you take a lot of courage, right? Because you think they're better than you. So why would he work for me? And you need, like, you need to be uh, either blind or stupid or courage or whatever, uh, courageous or something to do it. So that partnership is really critical. Um, you want to look at also, uh, a lot of people fall on the CV. Mm -hmm. If you went to the Technion, he must be smart. I've seen many people that are fucked up. Right. Okay, who study like really impressive. It's not with, always the best measure. Right, because also it's all the psychological makeup, right? So they may be smart, but they're really passive aggressive or they're really borderline and they flip around and they like, you can't tell what's, what's going to happen. So it's like you, you want to you wanna find st their story uh, and then spend time and then maybe use some feminine intuition to see what's going on, are they are, are they dateable, right? So, <laughs> okay. um, and uh, it's critical. Just, just. Uh, just what do you mean? What do you mean by are they dateable? What are you looking for? I would say if you spend time with them and you want to spend more time with them, okay. and you want to see them again, then most likely other people will also want to spend more time with them. If you spend time with them and basically just, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, of course, yeah, yeah, it's like, okay, move on. Right, but this is like a marriage, really. It's for the long haul, and you need it's someone that you actually enjoy being in their company. It's, yeah, it's even worse, right? Marriage, you can, there's a practical to divorce, you can't. It's like, it's <laughs> they, they, once you get the shares, they have the shares, there's no undo. It. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a long-term relationship with a lot of commitment and creativity to create, uh, I guess, some kind of a family or something together. Okay, so you mentioned um, personality disorders, right? You mentioned borderline and such. And before uh, we started today, you talked about how being an entrepreneur has a very bipolar element to it, right? There's a manic depressive nature to it where you have these really extreme highs these manic episodes, right, when your s belief in yourself is, and the optimism is never ending. And then you have the lows, right? You have um, disappointments, you think something's gonna go your way and it doesn't. And my question is, how do you navigate between these highs and lows? Yeah, so manic depressive can be interpreted in two ways. 
The first is that the nature of entrepreneurship is, is manic depressing because of the just you have an amazing day and then you have this disaster. So that's like how do you accommodate the change into the, I guess, uncertainty and, and stability and I guess disappointment and uh, these extreme changes these extreme too. Changes. Yeah, so it can be like a really uh, destabilizing in many ways. But I will also look at manic depressive. Sometimes, if a person is manic depressive as a, as a personality disorder or let's say tendencies, right, the manic phases are pushing him and everybody else to do the impossible. Right? So I'm not surprised that some of the best entrepreneurs have some kind of bipolar the tendency. It's, that can be sick, but some tendency where they have phases where they, they can think way over what is realistic. Sometimes, you know, you, the only way to succeed is to not know that it's impossible. So then you can succeed. But I would say that, I guess, appreciating and learning personality uh, tendencies and disorders is a, is a pretty effective tool. And I would say, starting from the negative side of it, right? So there's certain type of personalities you do not want in your organization. If someone is passive aggressive, that means they, that they practically, that means that instead of saying something is wrong, they act weird, they drop the water or they do something crazy. There's a toxic energy that starts to fester and the conflict is never actually solved. Exactly. So passive aggressive is not funny. That can toxic the whole company. So that's like one thing you want to avoid and you want to identify it and you want to at least attune to it. And I think the best way to describe it is when everybody else is upset or frustrated or don't sleep at night and the person is, I don't know, I'm doing everything okay. It's, that's like, so you want to avoid that. Another type of personality is, would be the, the, the borderline. So if you, someone come to work and you just don't know what's going to happen next and you're afraid of saying good morning because maybe it's going to flip on you. Capricious it's, and uh, Yeah, so that's volatile. not good, not good for organization. And as a founder CEO, you have the powers to let people go and you should use it. And it doesn't matter if you're agreeable or not agreeable or a pleaser. If you have people that affect the organization badly, they should go. It's critical. So, so this it's is another a question I had for you. And that is, when do you know it's time to let somebody go, right? W what are certain things that you say, okay, there's no going back, right? There's no fixing this or improving, but this person doesn't fit. So there are certain people that there's a moment, the first time you think about it is the time you need to let them go. It obviously, you don't do it. It's not right. You can be psychopathic, but there's a moment that you know it's not gonna work. And that's like, from that moment, that point on, it's just how you build it around yourself and how you, how you do it and how you manage it. But there's a moment where you just, you just know. Those are easy ones. And then it's the courage of the CEO to be able to look at the truth in the eye and says, okay, there's a problem. Let's fix it as, as quickly as possible. Um, that's a, but those are easy ones because you just need some guidance and you need to work with someone who kind of support you on those decisions and you're okay. The trickier one is that people are okay and they're fine. It really, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But if they would be replaced by someone who's amazing, you would get 10 times more. And those are the silent killers because they're fine. Really, there's nothing. They come to work, they do a good, decent job. But it was someone amazing. And you can see it in the extreme, you can see it in sales. In sales, people go to a meeting and they can walk away and everybody in the room wants to work with you. And there's people who go to the room and it's okay. Yeah, everyone had a nice time, but and if they weren't, yeah, let's wowed. continue. Yeah, let's continue the next quarter or whatever. You didn't. So, so and as, if you look at the data science and you look at the R&D and there are people who understand the problem and they come the next day and it's solved. And there are people who say, we need to do it and next quarter we'll put it into the program and we'll edit. And those people make all the difference in the world. And it's just so I would say, um, and then again, this is really my experience, but I would say people that are wrong, take whatever time you take you to let, to let them go, but just do it as quickly as you can. Sometimes you just, you need to build up the momentum. Uh, and people that are not good enough. So I think one of the psychological blocks that exist is that obviously there is a guilt that comes with firing somebody, but there's also the commitment you have to your company. And I think that's a really important note to make where 
If someone isn't pulling their weight, you have a responsibility to the rest of your employees and to everyone else to make sure this ship is moving in the right direction. And it's true because if anything, I would say first, we can include in this, it's important not to include any other ideological agenda into running the company. So if for some reason you think you went to the Boy Scouts and you think that, you know, being inclusive and helping the weak is important, that's probably a poor decision for the purpose and the focus of what the company is built for. You can do it when you're profitable. You can do it when you have one chance to succeed. I think you have responsibility for the employee time. They dedicated their time and career to work with you. They're spending every day. If they're working suboptimal because you think that you can let someone that is weak to be part of the company because you don't have the courage to let them go, then you're wasting their time. And I think that's how it should be looked. And it's really important. And I think many companies make a mistake of letting people go too late. So let's talk about this whole idea of company culture, right, and good leadership. And what I want to know is, what does a good leader look like in your opinion? What does a good leader need to have and what kind of relationship does a leader have with their employees? I, I, there's no one way to do it, uh, but there are some things that you can't, that cannot, that are in, intolerable. So there's many ways to do it and think if, if anything, there is such thing as company culture. And when people join a company, they adapt themselves to the culture. It is just really, it, it's intangible, but it's there. Um, but then the CEO dictate the culture and you cannot be what you're not. So if you are a people person, it's going to be a lot of people person. If you're a kind of Excel person, it's going to be a lot of Excel. It, it's, it, it's going to affect the culture. It's, that's okay. There's no one way to do it. However, if there's no trust, it's a problem, right? Right. Uh, if there is a lot of uh, illegitimate political agenda of very personal, okay, if you disrespect people, those things hurt. If people don't sleep at night, not because they care about the product, because they care about being abused, abused in the sense that like they are being offended or taken advantage of yes or just don't don't give the credit or being stolen the credit from or when you have a mass distribution email where you disrespect someone publicly shame somebody then those things are a pretty good indication of of what not to do what not to do yeah so yeah it, it eventually it's a it's a collective group that comes together to create value you better like what you do you better enjoy you better respect each other you better appreciate other people's skills and what they bring to the table. You better be honest and fair, and you better care about the customers. You better be proud of what you do. You better be able to go home and say, listen, we're doing really something amazing. Uh, and if it's not, then it's a very slippery slope. So I think one of the challenges is that when the company grows, how do you maintain the company culture and the work ethic? Because you can't micromanage and you can't be everywhere at once. So you're kind of trusting that the company culture is trickling down, right? The, the company culture of excellence and hard work. And there's this phenomenon called Price's Law, which states that 50% of the work that's done in a company is done by the square root of the, num the total number of the people in the company. So it means that as the company grows, incompetence grows exponentially and competence grows linearly. So what do you think is the remedy for that? And how do you, how do you go into an entrepreneurial venture knowing that as it grows, this can happen? Right, so maybe I'll, I'll explain a little bit kind of, and I agree with that law completely, and I think it's true for any company that creates stuff, is you're gonna have, if you have 10 people, three will be critical. If you have 100 people, 10 will be critical. So I would divide this from company culture, but I would say in principle, whatever group of people you have, identify the people that cannot go. The superstars. Yes, they, that holds the weight of the success of a company. And it can be, it's definitely not by hierarchy, right? It can be the, someone in R&D that is just critical for that phase, uh, that holds everything. It can be relationship manager, it can be, many people that are at this point critical. It may not be the CFO. CFO is more, less, less likely to be cr that critical. It may less likely to be HR person. But you have people that are just really, really critical. Identify them. Make sure they don't leave. 
It's almost like the discussion needs to be, you're not leaving. You don't think about it. You don't even consider it. You don't dream about it. <laughs> now let's discuss what it's going to cost me. But you want to make sure that you have an anchor team that stays with the company. That will make the rest of the people stick as well. People stick to success. And I think that's, this price is always really important because it gives, it gives you kind of some kind of a point of reference. If you talk about bonuses and options, etc., those are the people that need to be taken care of. The rest may or may not go. Right? The deviation from that law is it's not, if you have 100 people, it's not necessarily only 10. It can be 12, it can be 15. So you can deviate if you actively choose and make sure that you have strong people in a certain position. You can't deviate too much just because that's nature, but uh, you can really kind of try to improve it, and that's that's important. Right, but it's knowing that this is kind of a fact of nature, really, and not trying to remedy it in the direction of trying to get everyone else to pull their weight, but as you said, identifying those key players and making sure they stay, they don't leave. It's not keeping them stay, it's keeping them stay happy. Sometimes for them to be happy, is to lay off someone else who pissed them off and just get on their nerves. And it's just the price to be paid. The, the other people did nothing wrong. But if you want to have someone fully functional, fully productive, given the environment, and they may be crazy, but that's what it takes. And uh, okay, that's like Machiavelli said in the 1400, uh, the purpose uh, the justified. The ends, ends uh, justify the means. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so keep them and keep them happy, keep them fully functional, productive, get them whatever you need, what else you need. Yeah, so that's how you can beat the law. Okay. As far as co you ask about company culture, right? And it's, I think, beyond just being who you are, okay? Uh, and kind of take the values that you believe in, and I think you can be better at communication communicate the values, talk about it, understand people. If someone leaves the company, find out why. Okay, that's like a lot of information right there. Go to the person says, okay, you'll get whatever you want, give me all the dirty details, why? How many nights you didn't sleep before you resigned? Who pissed you off? What was wrong about it? Okay, this is someone that you don't want to leave, have decided to leave, critical. Don't be offended, don't be, um, disappointed, research, find out why, because right, that's... that's. Uh, I think that's a huge point because a lot of people would just kind of shut the door behind that person and not think about it twice, but really there's such a rich source of information there because they can tell you about whatever's not working and maybe you'll find out that you know they just didn't fit the Typically, when someone leaves, there were many, many, many signs before that. There were red flags already. Absolutely. No, but that's, that's so important of keeping your ears open to all of these things. So, you know, throughout this process of being an entrepreneur, one of the main components is raising money. And first of all, there's a few questions. At, first of all, at what point do you bring investors in, right? How long do you bootstrap it? And at what point do, do you actually bring people on? And how do you sell them on your vision, right? There's a big component here of, you know, they're, they're betting on you. And you need to convince them that you're worth betting on. So how, how does this usually go? And what do you look for in the types of investors that you raise money from? And how do you bring people on board with your idea? I think there's, there's no, uh, we, we're speaking about not the mechanics, but the soft side of things, right? So. I would say um, you're going to need some storytelling skills and that you can learn. Um, I think we, spent, we mentioned before, but learn, speaking to industry expert, believing in your idea, not because it's logical, because on the empirical side of things, because you've spoken to industry expert and they've told you the trends and you can speak way beyond the depth of the question you can get is critical. And if you are now spend enough time to be a baby industry expert, you can speak about it with confidence that you believe in it. And whatever they ask, you can see the you can finish their question and all the answers and you can tell all the risks and you know the risk and you face the risk and you don't try to romanticize everything and there's nothing they can say that basically 
you didn't think about it well in advance. Right. Do and your you homework. Do your homework. Way do your homework. And then all of this you can put into good storytelling. You should be able to, uh, to get by. We're speaking now. This is uh, uh, end of 21. And there's way more money than initiative. So this is a really unique time in history where you don't need much to be able to get a chance to succeed. It may change by the time this video become, right? <laughs> and then it's a whole different story. Where right now, if you have it come together, you have a good team, you have access to a good team, you show that you can put this together, you're responsible, you're trustworthy, you mean what you say, you're committed to do the thing, you can say, listen, I'm gonna spend the next few years doing nothing but this. I'm gonna focus on it, and if it's not gonna work out, I spend all this time then you can give me the money because I'm spending my time and life on this one. And you believe that what you're giving them the opportunity to let you run with the idea, okay? Right, and so at what point do you bring investors in? It depends that you believe in the product, that you believe that you can take their money and give it back to them with high multiple. So if you don't believe in your product enough, then keep bootstrapping it? Then don't spend it? your time on it. Don't spend, don't, don't, don't waste your time, yes. Okay. Yeah, don't take money from people before you, you know that this is, this is one way ticket. Okay, when you're totally invested in it yourself, is what you're saying. You wouldn't just spend, you spend you, if someone asks you, are you gonna spend the next three years doing just this? And you said yes, <laughs> then, then you know you can take the money. Okay, okay. and what? It's not because I feel sorry for their money. I'm sure they're not gonna cancel the script trip. It's about just the misery that comes with the commitment of taking the money without knowing that you're gonna be able to Execute. Right. You're basically signing up for being accountable to them and you don't want to disappoint and you don't want to take their money and, yeah. you know, have it be for nothing. Yeah. And get pregnant when you're ready to get pregnant. <laughs> it's just like, it's, yeah. Exactly. This okay. is a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. So in terms of the qualities in the investors, are there certain people that you would rather raise money from and certain people that you might not want to get into this bed with? Yeah. So this is a very, very important point because you can get, it doesn't matter how of a successful you know, person you think you are, or people think of you, you can be a really, really miserable, abused uh, person once you take money from VCs and you have the wrong board. So board can be very, very unpleasant, very demeaning, very, very almost humiliating places where you need to dance to the music of some really awkward, mean, sadistic people. Oh man. So uh, yes, and I think you know, if you look online, a lot of entrepreneurs, they can speak about the board and they, I mean, they need uh, like almost uh, defibrillators. I mean, this is really, really traumatic events. So you want to spend time with, uh, with the investor. Uh, if I spoke before about uh, how to get the, the knowledge about your partners, your actually uh, co-founders, it's even more so on the, on the partners. You want to ask him, give me names of company you invested in. Talk to them. Listen to what they don't say. Listen to the speed they respond. Ask them, will you get money from this person again? And you count the seconds before they say yes. They have to say yes. But yes. <laughs> okay. So make sure that uh, the, they're, okay, so find their story. Make sure that you connect with those investors well, that they're going to, back you up on decision that the board not going to be um, beating ground. Right. There's investors that can really be in your corner and support your growth and your development and other investors that... You will have conflict with your investors. Your investors are not your friends, they're your business partners. You will have conflicts. You want to know how they deal with those conflicts. Um, there's also something which is even not, not, not related to the personality, but related to the, to, the, to the setting. You need to learn the, I guess, corporate governing of the fund that you're talking to. So if the fund is in the early stages of the fund or the late stage of the fund, it makes a big difference. If the fund have a very good portfolio or very bad portfolio, it makes a big difference. If the person is strong at the fund or weak at the fund, it makes a big difference. So you need to learn all of this. You need to know what you're getting into. You need to really speak their language before. Sometimes you can be a great person, but he's just too weak within the fund to make the decision right. you need him to do. And they may not fund you the next time because he's just not strong, at, not, f not strong at the fund. So there's a lot of questions you need to answer. It's not just a personality, but you need to know the whole dynamic and 
way it works on the funds. Right, and I mean certain funds would probably be looking for things that are a quicker win, right? Like a, the success, the timelines may be five years and others are willing to stick it with you for 10, 15 years. So that's or also a factor. Or the other way around, let's say that you know, you're gonna get a way to sell the company at you know, $50 million in like a year. And that's like infinite amount of money for you. But the fund will say, we will not let you sell the company. It doesn't matter, even if it's going to go to zero, because we don't have the agenda to sell it if it's below 400. And now you have stack for another four years because they, do, they, wouldn't, they don't want to sell. You may make more money, but you may get nothing. But you're definitely going to spend a few more years before you get to that valuation. Now what? Right. Okay, so and that needs to be discussed. That needs to be agreed. Okay. So that's another point about how do you choose your point of exit, right? There's so many different ways that a company can become a success. And how do you know when is the right time for you and when is the right time for the company? So it used to be pretty, pretty brutal in a sense that the, you, you, they would keep the CEOs all the way to the end. And if you had a good exit at the end, you would make a lot of money and you would be filthy rich. Nowadays, there is a conflict between the way that the institution money works and the personal, right? So you as a founder, you have a family or you have a person or you have a bank account. And for you, uh, most amounts are infinite, right? Because if you make a few million dollars, I mean, that's okay, like, okay, oof, well, that's like, whoa. You change your destiny and you change the destiny of your family. If, if you have one or you're gonna have one. Um, but the VC is gonna say no. So you have a conflict of interest right there. Luckily, what happens more and more is that as you move on with the rounds of finance, they're gonna offer you to have secondary. So they buy some share from the founder, so the founder has some liquidity. And that's a big deal. You can have a baby exit on the way. In other words, if you manage to build a product that people are willing to pay for it, you create value, you have customers, you have an ecosystem, you are pretty much in a place where people are willing to already pay money for the shares. So that secondary was a game changer. And now you have more and more founders, entrepreneurs says, okay, great, I took some money out, I'm okay. I can buy a new car, but I'm moving on. And I wanna actually continue with the dream. I like the team I, I hired, I like the space, I understand it, I, I see how I can take this company and navigate it forward. And then you can slowly uh, grow into it and then align your interest with, with uh, institution money. Right, so it's um, very dynamic and there's... It's very dynamic, but I'm saying the good thing about it is you as an entrepreneur, you may get liquidity way faster than it used to be. Okay. okay, and that's like it's a good thing. In other words, it's not even, nobody bought the company. Other funds are willing to pay you money for share that you got at like a year ago at zero. Okay, so... Right, so the situation is better. Yeah, so life is very good for successful entrepreneurs. If, if, if you manage to build a good company, life is very good these days for entrepreneurs, yes. Okay. So now, just to wrap up a bit, from our entire conversation today, if people back home listening would take away one thing from our conversation, what would you want it to be? If you are serious about your career and you're not worried too much about work-life balance and Rishi Kash in India, or, and you want to do something meaningful and purpose and you can change your destiny, then entrepreneurship has probably never been as promising as today whether it's solo entrepreneurs and you can have your own store on Amazon or you can have your own, you know, creativity stuff on, on Etsy or Fiverr and you can do stuff. You can start and slowly build beautiful businesses. If you want to go for bigger entrepreneurship and, and there's just tons of money for waiting for people to take their destiny, find good people around them and go and build value. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful time in history that right. people can just change their their entire it's a dynasty right so because I mean with the amount of money that was made in 2001 uh, this generation and generation goes by right, yeah, the so sky's the limit and um, the opportunities are there yes like I, why would do something else like why would, I mean seriously like if you have it and you have the drive and then the wisdom and the charisma and the, or just the, just really the drive just everything else you can compensate just, just do it just go for it. Go for it. There's enough. I mean, do your homework. Do your homework. Just don't jump on it. But once you spend the time focusing and identifying what you can be good at, what you can, you know, the idea, the space, etc., then absolutely. Amazing. 
Yuval, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you to everyone out there who tuned in. My name is Roni Furon, and this is The Bigger Picture. Make sure to hit subscribe and to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode.